This is We The Sales Engineers Podcast, show 284. Welcome to We The SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. What's up, SE Nation? I am your host, Ramsey Majaba. Welcome back to another episode of We The Sales Engineers. This is show 184. So if you're looking for show notes, it's wethesalesengineers.com slash show 184. And I have a great guest today. His name is Max Van Burke, who is the director of pre-sales at Plural Site for EMEA. EMEA stands Europe and Middle East and Africa. Yeah. And with Plural Site, if you're not familiar with that website, you should check it out. It is a learning website. We focused on learning today. That's something that seems to be uh, <clears throat> close to Max's heart. And quite frankly, I think it's a, it's a great, like, you can't be a good sales engineer without having the capacity or capability to learn. And there are different ways of learning, which we will cover, um, different techniques that he talks about today and what, what the role of the SE manager is in learning. We dig a little bit deeper into different areas. Also, we touch on some areas that we didn't get the chance to dig deep in because, well, I really wanted to cover the learning topic because we've covered other topics in other places. But if there's a specific topic that you want me to talk about with Max, please check out the show and uh, let me know which one and I'll try to get him back on the show. So without further ado, let's just jump into the show. Mr. Van Burke, welcome to the show. Hey, Ramsey. Thanks uh, for having me. It's it's definitely my pleasure. Uh, we we have a lot of topics to cover today, but before we get there, I want to know a little bit more about you and how you got to where you are today. So do you mind sharing a little bit of your journey with us? Yeah, um, no problem at all. Um, so I started in tech, I don't know, 16 years or so ago um, and moved into pre-sales around a decade ago. It was kind of super accidental. Um, I just started a new job um, as an application consultant, whatever that really was. <laughs> um, and I, in one of my first days, I was manning the, the hotline of the company back then. And comp um, a customer, a prospect actually called and said, hey, we would love to see uh, what you're doing. <laughs> so naive as I was um, and unconsciously incompetent as I was, I just showed them what we had. <laughs> so basically gave my first software demo without even knowing what it is, that it's called a demo or whatever, right? Um, and basically from then onwards, I was in pre-sales suddenly. No one in that company called it pre-sales. So it took me a couple of years until I really found out <laughs> what the job is called. Um, and yeah, from there, um, after a couple of years, moved to, to Microsoft as a pre-sales um, specialist, first more on the technical side, then more on the sales side of things, before joining Pluralsight a um, bit over four years ago. Um, and there I moved from an individual contributor role towards a manager and then director role. So right now I'm director of EMEA pre-sales here at Pluralsight. Um, okay. And yeah, that's basically my pre-sales journey. All right. Um, you just said something. You moved to Microsoft first from the technical side and then into the sales side. Can, can we elaborate a little bit more? Because in theory, sales engineering is a technical. Well, some people think sales engineering is just technical. And sales, yeah. being a salesperson is sales. So what do you mean by technical versus sales side? So so Microsoft kind of has two pre-sales roles. They probably have more, but uh, I'm only aware of those two. One is more focused on uh, deep technical knowledge. Okay. So that's the technology solutions prof professional. While on the other side, they have solution sales professionals, which are more focused on the business goals behind it. Right. So um, it's, it's a bit odd to make that separation, I think. Um, but as a solution sales professional, you carry your own quota, et cetera. So um, you're basically the you're set, uh, specialist sales for okay. for a certain area. Um, okay. But I would still say it's a pre-sales role. Okay. So 
a, they might also have a generalist role, like a core role that sells everything. And then yeah. the, the special, the technology solution pro professional is the specialist, the technical specialist behind them. And the solution specialist is the commercial yeah. specialist behind it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of companies have that, or most companies. Like, they're either called generalist SEs with specialist SEs. Some companies, specialist SEs have salespeople, which is what you had at Microsoft, or what you yeah. were. And some don't, where the specialist SEs, like, on their own. Uh, okay. Why yeah, that was kind of the... Go ahead. Sorry. That was kind of the only time uh, where I worked at a really large corporation where there was even enough people to split yeah. the roles in that way. So uh, that was basically my only experience in a large uh, operation. My, my previous company that I worked for, it was like 1,500 people. It wasn't large in comparison to Microsoft. And they had that. Okay. And then some, some, at some point, they laid some of them off and never hired anyone to replace them. So it was a mix and match. Like specialist, yeah. like, I'm looking at your LinkedIn, you were a specialist in modern workplace. Mm -hmm. right for uh, i'm sure they're specialists in other areas as well so yeah modern workplace could have a, a sales specialist or a solution specialist other areas may not within the old company okay interesting yeah now at microsoft it was basically one for um for microsoft azure so the cloud side of things yep. one for dynamics crm etc yep. uh, one for modern workplace i think they recently are recently also started to to focus more on uh the power platform okay. um, and have solutions professionals for that a friend of mine is a specialist for just like teams like okay. co collaboration wow. yeah he, he was at cisco he was a collaboration uh, he was a journalist se focused on collaboration and then he moved to to microsoft and he's just teams basically oh well, i say yeah. teams you know he, he probably he's probably upset with me right now because i just oh, he sells teams you know so okay. yeah there's there's a lot of that unified communication yep. stuff behind it and that's uh that gets way more complicated than than you would ever think but yeah but like uh, here's the that's the interesting part right when you're a se and what you're selling to the customer in the end the end product which is teams what needs to happen in the back end to work, the customers don't care about. And as yeah. soon as you start talking about it, you just lose the customers. So, yeah, it's uh, nobody cares, basically. All your hard work is gone. Nobody cares about <laughs> it. Okay. Yeah, and the problem is when, you, when you're such an expert on one of these topics, uh, it's often um, hard to, to remember that the person you're talking to might not be on the same level. So if yeah. you're talking to... Um, to a business user or a, or a manager or so, uh, they typically, as you said, don't care about all the backend functionality, right? So if you start listing all the things that need to be in place to get things set, set up and all the 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 details that we in pre-sales kind of always love to know yep. about, yep. Uh, a business user doesn't yep. know, doesn't care. And often um, just because they don't have years of experience in that area, um, often just don't understand what you're talking to, uh, talking about. So that's kind of the curse of knowledge uh, or expertise in pre-sales. I see that all the time. Well, I, I don't know if you've ever seen those videos on YouTube of like a scientist explaining to like kid of like people from five years old all the way to like PhD. Yeah. It's the same thing with pre-sales, right? We have to adjust what we're talking about to who we're talking to. And usually the decision makers are the people who know less. And yeah. they don't, they just want to be able to communicate. But that's also actually a great way to learn things. Um, so um, there's this concept of Feynman um, technique. Feynman was a, a yeah. physicist, physicist, sorry. Um, and his technique is basically learn something, try to teach it to a five year old, um, identify the gaps in, in what you learned, and then sim simplify it again. And that's a great way to to build knowledge and to build skills uh, by actually teaching them, sharing them, and identifying those gaps in your in your own knowledge. That's how you and I connected, right? Um, I started trying to learn AWS. I'm using Cloud Guru, which is now owned by Plural Sight, the company you yeah. work for, and I'm I'm doing exactly that. I'm putting myself on YouTube, knowing nothing about AWS, and trying to explain <laughs> it as if I, you know. 
not to a five-year-old, but someone, maybe someone who's in also my position. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I, I really enjoy that technique. Well, I enjoy that technique if I don't have to put it on YouTube. Right? Once, once you need to put it on YouTube, it's a little bit more stress. Yeah. But, Learning in public is, uh, is actually a great way to, to do that, but it's also, also really hard because again, on the other side, you have all those experts who are already on the expert level yep. and um personally when when i write online or so i'm always conscious of a hey, that's something that other people know tons more about than i do uh yep. who am i to, to actually talk about that right so um that's that's definitely something that that impacts me when i yeah try to to go out there and teach something or talk about something right, well let's i know that wasn't the topic that we're gonna that we're going to discuss it's adjacent so let, let's tackle that a little bit how did you overcome that like i had the same issue when i was started writing blogs about sales engineering you know as uh someone who's been doing it for only a few years how did you overcome the fact that some people may know more about a topic than you and yet you're still using the Feynman technique publicly um you know the thing is even though there are tons of people who know more about that than you. Um, on the other side, there are millions of people out there who know less uh, than you do, right? So even if you're just one step ahead of, of someone else, so you put one more hour into a topic or you learn one more concept, uh, you're already in a position where you, you can share things, right? And you can talk about things. And again, not everyone is an expert. So um, I think breaking it down into a really small piece and talking about that piece um, really helps. Instead of going all in and explaining everything there is to know about a concept, uh, which is daunting, <laughs> yeah. uh, breaking it down into kind of atomic pieces and uh, writing about that or sharing things about that uh, can be really helpful in, in overcoming that. At least it's for me. Yeah. Um, so uh, the way I thought about it, I 100% I agree with everything you said. The way I thought about it is like, hey, the questions I had yesterday and I know today, these are the questions I will answer. Yeah. Right. Because like you said, there's always someone who doesn't know, who knows less than me and I can help in a one way, shape or form. Not only that, I also came to the realization that if I say something and you say something, you will reach a certain audience because you speak in one way. I'll reach a separate audience because I speak differently. Yeah, so you can exactly. have two experts teaching the same thing differently to different people and it works. And between the two of us, we make one whole, one like better uh, teacher, if you will, but yeah. so we can help people. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's also something that happens often in pre-sales, right? Uh, when I first started, um, the customers that, or it was an AI company for retail, right? Uh, where we had AI solutions for retail. And I knew nothing about retail, except that I went to supermarkets on a very regular basis, right? <laughs> um, and, but what you need to, to see is that even though the people you talk to know tons about retail and category management, all, all kinds of things, they're still typically not experts for the solution you are selling, right? So uh, in almost all cases, except when that business is a previous customer of yours or an uh, existing customer, uh, you know more about that solution, even as a beginner in that role or uh, just joining a new company. So remembering that, I think it really helps overcoming that um, yeah, almost imposter syndrome or so yeah. that you might face. So I've used that to my advantage in some situations where <clears throat> I tell them, okay, I'm an expert in this, but I have no idea what you guys do. Do you mind sharing what you do? Like I'm a, <clears throat> I use your, like I want to, some of my customers are network providers, right? And I sell test equipment for a network. It's like, Hey, I've configured your routers. I know how to use them, but I don't know the work that takes place behind the scenes to get it to work. Yeah. Can you share some of that with me? And people like to talk about themselves and they're generally passionate about it and they get to tell yeah. you about their hard work and you get to understand the pains that they're going through. So when you're trying to help them solve a problem, now you're discussing 
their pains, not what you assume is their pain. So, yeah. That's a great. Yeah, and I think absolutely, um, totally agree with you. That's that's a great technique and really helps. Um, it helps to help people open up, right, uh, with that. Um, and I think that curiosity that you show with that is also key part of continuous learning, right? Uh, um, it's not always just about selling, right? It, curiosity really helps you build those skills, understand people better, understand what you're doing better and the impact you're having on people. Um, and I think that's a great motivator behind learning as well. Yeah. And it disarms, like from a just soft skills perspective, it disarms the class. I, I put a post a couple, I think last week, is there's a thin line between a smart, being smart and being a smart a ASS, <laughs> right? And like being smart allows you to actually have conversations and learn from the customer. Whereas the other one, you're just telling the customer, you're you're the smart person in the room, you're going to tell the customer what to do and that doesn't help. Um, you mentioned continuously, like continuous learning. I, yeah. I want to dig into that a little bit because I feel like that's sometimes the hardest part of being a sales engineer because it's one of the most important aspects of the job, least urgent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So can we discuss that a little bit? Like, what, When you say continuous learning, what is it that you're talking about? So I think there are two sides to that, right? There is prescriptive or more formal learning, but on the other side, also informal learning. So um, I think... Prescriptive learning is more priority driven. So your company tells you, hey, you need to learn about this and this uh, by the end of Q3, <laughs> right? Uh, here are five enablement sessions, uh, I'm gonna teach you this, this and this. Um, I think that's often also related to role readiness where um, you have to kind of have specific check marks behind uh, certain skills and knowledge. On the other side, you have informal learning, which is, um sorry the light just went off <laughs> uh, which is more around um keeping keeping ahead when when it comes to new technologies industry trends um skills that you want to build as an as an individual right and um both are important but i think there's an inverse relationship between expertise and uh, prescriptive learning the more you know about something and i mean really know about something the, the less prescriptive learning you need. If you've worked for 10 years in an is industry, another um, company session about buyer personas for that specific industry won't really help you develop new skills. But reading, uh, reading a blog post by, by an expert who is currently disrupting the industry, that's something that, that really builds new perspectives, new um, new ways of thinking, right? And I think you need to, to kind of do both, obviously. Um, or No, it's not obvious, but you need to do both. <laughs> um, and as an organization, you need to support both. You need to, to encourage people to stay curious, to learn things, and as a manager, help them free up the time for that. Um, be it, or you can start with easy things like blocking one hour per week, right? But um, what often happens is that other more urgent things or perceived more urgent things come in the way. There's another customer meeting because the account executive is ignoring your protected learning time, or you are um, ignoring your protected learning time because you're working on an RFP or so, right? But as a manager, I think checking in with people and showing that you're also using that time to learn. Sharing the topics that you care about, um, I think really helps to lead by example. Um, so we, for example, here in, in my organization, we are sharing um, every Friday at 2 p.m. when our protected learning time starts, we are sharing in our Slack channel what we're learning about. Um, it keeps us honest, uh, but it also, helps people find other topics that might be relevant um, for them. Um, right? by, by sharing um, what courses you're taking on our own platform or what podcasts you're listening to or what books you're reading, you, you help build that, that library of potential learning avenues yeah. uh, as a team. And I think that's, that's quite important. So team learning 
in general, I think is, is super important. Okay, I have many questions, but first I want to summarize. <laughs> you had you mentioned perspective learning and formal learning, and I want to make sure I didn't confuse the two. Perspective learning is uh, like when the manager gives you like, hey, you need to learn this by the end of the year. Yeah. I, I would have thought formal learning would have been more like that. Formal learning is more learning about the company or can you repeat formal learning? What does it mean? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I mean, I meant uh, prescript, uh, prescriptive learning and informal learning. Informal, okay. Hey, right. Sorry. <laughs> that makes my life easier. <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, okay. So you mentioned that, oh, the company needs to support both, like uh, uh, sub, uh, well, sales enablement team or the pre-sales enablement team should uh, help with the prospective learning. Most companies- there is one. Sorry? If there is one. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Most companies don't have a pre-sales enablement team and every SE is on their own. Uh, yeah. Sometimes managers are managing 20 people, so they don't have time to tell people what to do. How how do you, uh, as someone from the outside looking in, how would you recommend an individual to go through a prescri prescriptive learning without any formal like mentoring from management? Um, so I think it's first important to identify where you are, right? So if possible, take some kind of assessment or uh, get an overview of the topic that you, you want to learn about. So it's easy for technical skills because you can use um, various assessments to, to figure out how skilled you are in a specific technology. So you have site we, we leverage, for example, our own platform for that. Um, but um, when you have identified where to start, um, typically for technical skills, there's a pretty clear outline, um, especially when it comes to, to topics where, where there is a certification in place. Right? Uh, for AWS, as an example, there's a clear path towards yeah. becoming a solutions architect yeah. um, in that area. Um, but for other things, it's way harder to build a prescriptive learning path when it comes to industry knowledge, right? Uh, understanding um, your buyers and their priorities. So that's, that's way harder to build. Um, and often a good starting point is to take what, um, for example, if there is one, the sales enablement team is using to, to build buyer personas or marketing personas, right? And ask them for, for the specific resources. How did you build that? Because then you can take that, um, the, the blog posts they've written, uh, the, that they've uh, read, or the, um, um, sorry. The YouTube video uh, or what, what? YouTube videos. The, or the store, the read. resource. Exactly, go to the source, yeah. right? And learn from the source. Um, talk to people uh, that are at the source of something. And then um, kind of, Again, use the Feynman, uh, Feynman technique to, to learn, teach, identify gaps, and simplify again. But again, it's, it's hard to, to build a, a learning path for, those, for that knowledge. Um, so yeah, that's, that's always a challenge. Um, and I think a lot comes down to to learning as a team, right? Identify those specific things that you need to learn about, that you need to, to understand as a team and kind of crowdsource um, learning. Ask people to share their favorite resources about, um, about the industry. Ask people to, um, to have brown bag sessions about specific things that they learned and then leverage that um, collective knowledge to build, uh, to build your team skills. Yeah, again, many questions are coming up. Uh, the first comment uh, is you talked about assessing technical skills. I find the easiest way, if, you, if nobody has access to different assessments, is if you're able to answer technical questions from a customer. <laughs> yeah. right? If you're failing that, you know you need to work on something. Uh, but like, as a manager, how do you assess your team's soft skills so that they know where to improve? Um. A lot comes down to observation, right? Spend time with your with your team. Uh, if you can, join customer calls. Uh, ideally, as a silent observer, you're not there to uh, to do the discovery or to do the demo or to jump in and uh, ask more questions. 
but you're there to to observe and help your team. That's your priority at the end. Yeah. Right? Um, often, or many companies have uh, libraries of call recordings, etc., that you can also leverage. Um, of course, you, also, you always need to keep scalability in mind, right? If you're managing a team of 20 people, you can't join uh, five customer calls per head per per week or so. Yeah. So, um, but you still, I think, need to make the time to to observe your people and uh, provide provide feedback. Um, ideally, you have you have a way to measure certain things, um, like did you did your tailor or did your SC tailor a demo to a specific use case? Or was it just a generic arbiter demo? Yeah. Uh, did you stop to ask questions? Uh, was the, the demo or presentation more of a conversation than talking to the customer? Um, and yeah, based on that, have those conversations with, with people. And uh, the good thing about um, what we call soft skills is that there are actually, uh, from my perspective, not really soft skills because they're you can improve, you can learn, uh, you can practice them and get better. Right? And um, from that perspective, I think they are actually hard skills that you can um, yeah, continuously improve. Yeah. And yeah. So you're saying soft skills in your, in your mind are actually hard skills simply for the fact that they can improve. Like, I guess the soft skills are just innate and hard skills are improvable is that no. yeah yeah so um yeah you're right um soft skills are harder to prove okay um but you can can improve them with the same techniques as as any hard skills or any uh, yeah. perceived hard skills and i wanted to comment about um you're saying like sales uh, and SE managers should attend calls and observe. I've been on, like I've chatted to so many sales engineers who get feedback from their managers that they're not doing something right. So they invite them on a call and then five minutes into it, the manager takes over. Not because the SE is doing badly. It's just because the manager has something to say and they don't, they don't know how to take a back seat. So I love that you highlighted that back that no, just take a step back and, yeah, and I think that's so crucial as a leader or as a, as a manager to to be able and step back, right? So, uh, uh, and it's but it's so hard. I know <laughs> because that's... because because you want to jump in and you want to support and you want to uh, to ask that question that doesn't come up and um, but you can't you you just shouldn't uh, because if you do that job then your team, uh, you're, you're robbing the team of the opportunity to improve. So, and that's, yeah. So if you're sitting there and you're watching someone not do well, they're, they're bombing and it's jeopardizing the deal. What, what, are, what is the priority at that point? Helping the SE improve or making sure that the deal is not lost? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, ideally, you... You support your team to get better before that happens, right? So you you help them um, with the the low lower risk deals, um, but but again, even you, you can even bump them, right? Uh, but still, helping someone get better um, is way more scalable than a single opportunity or a single call, right? Yeah. If that person gets better. And the next five calls or 10 calls or 50 calls will be better. Um, if, you, if you jump in and take over that one call, the next five, 10 or 50 calls will not improve. Um, so it's, it's a fine line. Um, I love that. And, well, it's but, just, yeah, it's well, really hard to... What's coming to mind is that, like, did, did you play any sports? Uh, yeah, played handball. Um, handball, and before that, ice hockey as a as a kid. Okay, okay. Um, so you start. You said ice hockey as a kid. And most people start playing ice hockey when they're kids, and then they keep getting better, and then they keep moving up in the ranks. 
And then if they're good, they get into the professional league. And even then they start off the bench and they br- they're they brought in for a smaller team and to earn more time. For some reason with sales engineering, we've never done sales engineering in our lives. Like you were, yeah. you were something completely different. Like before you became an SE, you didn't even know you were an SE initially. Right. And a lot of, a lot of managers make the mistake of assuming like, Oh, we hired this person. They're going to be great day one. Just throw them in there. And see what happens but we never get any practice ahead of time so i love yeah. the fact that you just said like start them slow like you basically set them up for success instead of failure which is some managers do well you know start with the lower risk opportunities and then graduate into the higher risk whereas a lot of managers also say like eh, we hired you go live long and prosper as paul would say um so uh you mentioned that some managers have to support it. You mentioned like one hour a week, for example. Generally speaking, from your experience, would one hour a week be enough for people to continuously learn? Like, can, can let's dig into that a little bit. Um, it's a starting point. Okay. Right. Um, but I believe you need to to learn and practice every single day. Um, ideally, um, or some companies have protected learning slots every day, but I don't think that really works uh, because there are having that every day makes it challenging with, with our priorities and customer calls, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, having, having a protected time slot once per week, again, is a starting point. Personally, um, I, I don't know. I think over the course of a week, spent probably like 15 hours or so learning new things um, on weekends or when I go for a walk, listening to a, a podcast or, or things like that, um, reading tons of books, etc. And I might be a bit obsessive when it comes to learning and to reading and listening, uh, but I think you should try or aim for a couple of hours per week. But um, Again, work, um, especially in sales or pre-sales, yeah. there, are, there are weeks or months where you just don't have the time to, to protect more than an hour per week. Yeah. And sometimes not even that, right? In Q4, yeah. um, I wouldn't expect people to, to protect, uh, protect that time slot over, over bringing in the last couple of deals of the year. Right. <laughs> right? Um, but ideally, you should. Yeah. Well, so like I'll, what I like to do is put a time slot every day. You mentioned companies that don't do a like do a time slot every day, and the reason I enjoy doing that is because if if something comes up and I miss one or two or three sessions, I still have two sessions that I've I've worked on. And so like it's protected, but I I'm more liberal with it. Whereas mm-hmm. you know when you have one one session a week. And something come up and you just lost that session. Like even though it's protected, yeah. customers always come first. So <clears throat> that's my perspective of it. Although, like you basically said, like one formal session a week where people share, but they should be doing stuff on their own uh externally as well. The other thing I think about is as sales engineers, we're always learning on the job too. Yeah. There we do have one session of deliberate learning, but everything we do, like whether we're setting up a VM or doing whatever it is that we need to do to actually help a customer with their demo with their POC or that's also learning time and you yeah can, like, it is yeah um so we shouldn't be confused between like dedicated learning time for new technologies versus day-to-day activities like even meeting customers and taking them out to lunch we can learn a lot just by being curious and asking questions oh yeah absolutely and you can learn a lot about uh the lunch price in different different cities and regions as well. <laughs> yeah, but okay. uh, but no, your but, favorite but no, diet to- too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I totally agree. Uh, every conversation that you have is an opportunity to learn. Yep. If you go into that com- uh, conversation with a mindset of curiosity and empathy, right? If you really truly care about learning something from that conversation, then you will. Uh, and people can feel that. If you just go there to, well, uh, to listen to them until you can finally pitch your thing, um, 
then they feel that. But yeah. if you're going in there to to understand them better, uh, it opens up people because they they can feel that. At least that's what I believe. No, I 100% agree. Mainly for the reason that if you're waiting for them to finish talking so you can pitch, you're generally not listening. You're generally <laughs> practicing the pitch in your head. Um, yeah. So it it shows. And I have two questions about like deciding what to learn. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a journalist at SE. I don't know what, how it works at in the, your organization. Uh, I, you might have multiple products or one, but I'm sure you have multiple technologies that people need to learn at one time to be able to do their job properly. If I'm brand new and I'm a generalist, how, like, how would you help me decide what is it that I need to learn first if I have a million things to learn? Because that's where the shiny object syndrome happens and we learn nothing. Just trying to learn yeah. everything at the same time. Yeah. Um, so luckily here at, at Pluralsight, we, we kind of have the, the learning uh, products, like Pluralsight Skills and a Cloud Guru. And on the other side, we have Flow, which is um, um, focused on, on engineering leadership or data for engineering leadership. Um, so it's it's a relatively easy um, to to focus on on either side. Uh, but I think the first thing you need to learn and probably spend the most time with is to to learn about the people who are buying your solution. Um, so um, for us, that means learn a lot about technology skills and how to build them. Learn a lot about uh, how learning and development departments work, learn about competitors and what they are doing. Um, and ideally, you do a lot of that before you even dive into to the platform. So you're learning <laughs> the business before you learn the technical. Yeah, because buyers want you or uh, want to have conversations with people who understand their business, right? Um, and then the next thing is use use the product if you can right, that might be hard for i don't know a middleware middleware product or something like that but if you can use it uh, try try things out uh, you uh, for um for for the friend of yours that you mentioned earlier who's focused on teams uh he probably spends a lot of time using teams and uh spend a lot of time uh at the beginning to to try things out learn things etc yeah. Um, and try things out until to until you get to a point where you think you can, could break that system. Uh, um, and yeah, get an become an expert by using it. Actually, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're not breaking it and you're not using it properly, at least yeah, <laughs> that's my. I, I came. I'm coming from a support background, and my job was to break my stuff so I can replicate customer issues. I, I like that. And, oh, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. So when, when I was, I've said this in the past that like, if I were to do sales engineering all over again, the first thing I would do is try to understand my customer's problems before I understand my product. Right? Because well, the first thing I did obviously is jump into my product and I learned how to do some stuff, which I then never used because my customers never use the product in that way. Yeah. Right. And I think, you can learn a lot just by talking to customers about the tech what technology you need to learn. It's the customers mm -hmm. who guide you wh where you need to go in terms of technology. Um, yeah. Right, so yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I like that. Oh. Um, I think that's also an important piece of um, how to to build better products, right? If um, <laughs> if the people who are talking to customers every single day uh, always focus on, on specific things that the customers care about. It's easy to identify the things that customers don't care about. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important as a pre-sales organization also to be in constant contact with product and feed those things back. Uh, tell people what, what customers are saying about it every single day. Um, and, but it's, it's often interesting to see which features or parts of a product sell versus what's actually being used in the real world um so if you have the opportunity to to talk to customers again uh after they they purchased um i think we should always 
always do that if we can to really understand okay how are you actually using that now um, often with um, sales teams being split up between acquisition and account management uh, it's hard to get the opportunity to talk to the same customer again yeah. but if you get it do it to yeah. learn more about yeah. them and the can, product can that be part of like the formal process like, like once you buy like what six months after like, you come back and do an interview or would the customer success team be able to help with that or the account management team? Um, yeah, I think I think there, there are ways to, to do that. I'd, um, I think it's important to have a good relationship with customer success anyway. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I think if you, if you talk to them, they typically don't mind to invite you on a, on a call, right? Yeah. Um, and from that perspective, go ask. It's uh, if they if they feel that the customer is open to having more people on the call or to to sharing things, then um, I've never seen anyone say no. Yeah. I, I don't want you there. Yeah. Um, but obviously, it's their call at the end, and uh, they need to make that decision. But um, yeah, again, if you have a good relationship with them or with the account managers. Um, that shouldn't be a problem. And it's also it's also very much dependent on the, how well the account managers built that relationship after. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. What, what if like I'm I'm learning AWS right now for myself? It's not very helpful for me in my work, other than you know being able to tell people I know a little bit of AWS, at least my customers. How do you feel yeah. about like your engineers or your SEs learning something just for fun? Like, how, how do you well, how do you recommend or do you recommend doing that or would you rather them focus on like there's a lot of things that you need to learn for my stuff why are you going out there and learning something that's unrelated how, how, what are your thoughts about that as an employer in general mm -hmm. and i i understand like in my head like why would an employer say yes so i'm just curious to ask you about <laughs> that. yeah so um again i'm in the, the lucky position here that uh we are encouraged and that I'm able to encourage people to learn technical skills. Um, so everyone in, in my team is, for example, AWS or Azure cloud certified, even though none of them builds solutions on Azure or AWS, right? Um, they, they went through the learning program because they wanted to see how our customers learn. Um, we had a formal process for that um, across the company. We called it Cloud Happy, where uh, people were encouraged to do that. Um, but we in pre-sales um, did that a bit earlier before the company started doing that, which was which was great <laughs> uh, for us. But in general, um, I think everything you learn uh, contributes to to you being a well-rounded person and professional. Right. If someone from my team tells me they want to learn about, I don't know, design thinking or behavioral economics because they're interested in that, um, I'm going to support them. Um, and uh, because you can tie most things back to, to a job in a, in a way, even if it's just being able to tell a good story about your, your learning journey. Um, so, of course, there are limits probably wouldn't pay for a year long subscription to uh, Fender plus to learn to play the guitar or so. Come on. Right? Uh, even though I would love to, to have a, a band here, <laughs> but um, um, I think it's still, still important to build skills and uh, in yeah. all kinds of way. So it's like case by case learning. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like. I am curious. This is unrelated to learning in general, but like a company or a, a product like Plural Sight, many people can just go in. And like I, I have a subscription to Cloud Guru right now, right? Because I thought it was, it was useful as an individual. Yeah. Like, how does that change the sales cycle for you? I, again, that's another complete topic. So if if you want to cut it short, we can. But how does it change the sales process for SEs? 
when you're working with customers who already use the product or potentially use the product? Um, it's a good question. Um, first of all, it's it's a bit of social proof, right? Uh, if individual users in an organization are already using their product uh, because they think it's great or because it's helping them, that's a great great piece of social proof, right? Uh, it, we we don't go and identify those those specific people who are doing that and go to their to, to their managers and say, hey, uh, Ramsey is using uh, a cloud guru to to learn. Uh, why don't we have a conversation? Um, but um, it's still if we know about that or if the managers know about that, it's it really helps to um, to open up and also get feedback on on what we're doing. Um, on the other side, I think, especially in what we do, and uh, you know, in all fairness, what a lot of our competitors are doing, um, you will always have a lot of people who are using those systems or uh, who are using uh, those platforms to build skills, be it Pluralsight, be it Udemy or LinkedIn Learning, yeah. right? Um, and I think that's that's great. It shows that that those organizations have curious people want to build and to want to learn okay. and i think that's a great starting point for a conversation about learning culture and about um yeah what's going on in an organization um i think you can also leverage that for plenty of other products be it personal productivity systems or be it um i don't know um ides or be it all kind of kind of things that people are using because they like it um, and being out there and listening to to that conversation that's happening in the real world in forums in discord uh um, on discord servers on linkedin etc or on twitter or x or whatever it's called now um helps you understand um yeah how people are using what you do and Again, I think it's also a great motivating factor to see that people actually benefit from what you do. Yeah, I should connect our sales enablement team with 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 plural site salesperson here in, in Canada because I've been using Cloud Guru and I like I bought Udemy courses and I've been using Cloud Guru. I, I just love the ease of use of their labs. Honestly, like Cloud Guru, I can just I'm, I'm not trying to toot your horn because you're in <laughs> EMEA and this is a North America, but hey, I, like I've I've enjoyed using it. It's overwhelming to learn something like AWS, and then having to go create your own uh, account, build your own network, and then I I I built I used Udemy and I did the labs, and then afterwards I got charged I don't know a few a few dollars here and there. Just I didn't know why because I forgot to remove something or another. So I really I really enjoy that. Oh, okay, last question that I wanted to ask, and again, it's just out of curiosity, you're the director for EMEA. Mm -hmm. okay. And EMEA is big. It's like saying, it's almost saying uh, director of the world because you have so many different cultures. <laughs> that It's basically, you 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 go over three continents uh, right now. How, how is it being able to do, like, how is it being a director of people of different cultures, different way of learning, different way of talking to each other. How do you how do you find doing that? Um, I love it. <laughs> it's okay. it's uh, you know, and it goes back to to empathy and curiosity. Um, when I was an individual contributor, one of the the first regions where where I worked here at Prosite was, uh, for example, in the Middle East, right and uh, I knew very little about that culture. So you need to to find ways to to stay curious without being nosy <laughs> in a way, right? And to to observe people and to figure out, okay, how how should I behave in a certain situation? And I think that's that's a lot of fun. Um and um Luckily, here in Dublin, we have um, also at Pluralsight, but also previously at Microsoft, uh, we have 
dozens of different nationalities um, across the, the different teams. Right? Uh, I can I can find probably like twenty different native languages just here in the office, um, and I can just talk to people about their experience. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it's it's actually easier than um, than what one would think as long as you're able to to adapt to specific situations and to specific cultural backgrounds. Um, sometimes that means I can can openly swear and curse uh, in calls. Sometimes it means I need to be very polite and very, very distant. Funny enough, especially with my own culture as a German, uh, I, I often need to be more polite and kind of show more professionalism in calls with German customers than I would do with uh, like an, an Irish organization or so. Not that the Irish are not polite and professional. That's not what I'm saying, but uh, you can interact differently. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we're about to jump into the not so fire on Max. And uh, I wanted to make sure, did, was there a question you were hoping I was going to ask that I did not? Um, no, I think, um, I think we covered kind of everything that I had here in my, my notes and <laughs> my prep. Uh, nice. I, I constantly over prepare for everything. Um, I, I, so... could see, I could see you looking at your notes and I, I have nothing other than <clears throat> me taking notes because I'm here to learn. Uh, okay. All right, so let, let's jump into the not so fire round, uh, Max. See, there's the same four questions I ask almost every guest, and I'd mm -hmm. love to hear your thoughts about it. And starting with number one is, what do you love about sales engineering? I love the challenge um, to because it's constantly evolving, and you constantly need to uh, to learn new things, uh, which is one of the greatest joys for me personally to learn things. And in sales engineering, you get the opportunity to do that every day. Nice. All right. Then that's a very good answer. Um, and I agree. Number it's two. It's not in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what do you believe is your superpower? Okay. That's a, that's a good question. I cook really good pasta. Um, it's not it's not an SE superpower. Okay. Um, Unless but, you invite um, a customer to dinner. Yeah, yeah usually, usually I don't, at, at least not at home. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to to being a, an SE, is to to visualize ideas in a in a simplified way. So whiteboarding, etc. I rarely use any slides. I I yes. think being interactive and visualize ideas. Um, is is probably what I what I'm really good at. I at least I hope. To, I would love to see you do that. I would like. I would love to role play with you, where I'm the customer and you actually use the whiteboard. Because it's, I like we always use the whiteboard in in the networking world. Mm -hmm. But even with uh, with COVID and everyone going remote, it became much harder, and everyone started drawing slides and then putting up the slides and it being less interactive. So, at some point, I'll I'll I'd love to see that. Uh, all right. Question number three: Is there a book or resource other than Plural Site Cloud Guru, or, or I mean, these are the two that I know of, uh, that you would recommend for people who are want to improve their technical or soft skills? Yeah, um, soft skills. Um, something that I read fairly recently: How to work with almost anyone. Uh, it's probably the best book I read on improving workplace relationships. And I think that's absolutely crucial for socials consultants. Um, and I forgot who the offer is. So uh, no worries. I'll, I'll yeah. find it. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, I love that. And I recommend it to absolutely everyone okay. uh, since I read that. Okay. And technical skills, I'll recommend Cloud Guru. That's what I'm using right now. Uh, all right, yeah, last, I can agree with that. <laughs> last question of the day is: Is there a habit you're working on in your to improve in your personal or professional life? A habit, um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to block more time to to focus. Um, I jump a lot between different things, different priorities, um, and quite good at managing those priorities but I need to block more time to actually think and sit down and 
do um, yeah focused work um, instead instead of doing twenty minutes there and another half an hour, a couple of hours later, I need to to get into a better rhythm of um, yeah blocking time for the important stuff. So so you mentioned I understand deep work. Well, one thing you mentioned uh, block time to think. I block time to think, and then I end up either falling asleep or. <laughs> like turn on my phone and playing with it for the duration of that block time. What, what does it mean for you? Like blocking time to think, how do you think? Um, I think with a pen in my hand. Okay. Um, and that really helps me to not fall asleep. Uh, I think if you, if you let your, your ideas and your thoughts flow on paper and I, I'm actually a, paper nerd but that's a different conversation um i think it helps you understand your own thinking like almost metacognition or so uh in a way thinking about thinking um and yeah putting things out there on paper or on a whiteboard or something is i think crucial for me to to actually understand what i'm thinking in a better way yeah i like that all right, Max, that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, if people want to reach out and connect with you, or if there's anything that the audience can do to help, please let us know. But where can people reach out and connect with you? Um, I think the easiest way is LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, reach out, have a have a, have a chat. Um, I'm usually open to, uh, to having a conversation. So um, yeah, looking forward to, to hearing from people. And is there anything the audience can do to help you? um share share good books with me <laughs> i'm <laughs> i'm always on the hunt for good books i'm at 53 so far this year so um i need more <laughs> how many did you read sorry uh, 53 this year just 53 so that's it B plus audiobooks <laughs> yeah no i'm just i'm, I'm i i'm still reading my first <laughs> okay all right we're gonna hang up before i feel too bad about myself. <laughs> thank you max for your time i appreciate it Thanks for having me. It was a great conversation. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Max, for coming on and sharing your knowledge. Um, whoever wants to connect with Max on LinkedIn, there's a link in the show notes. Also, the book that he mentioned is in the show notes as well. I think one of the biggest tips that I can provide for people who want to learn or continuously learn, don't know what is just be self-aware and listen to people. Generally, they are telling you without actually telling you. So I mentioned in the call, if there's a comment or a question that you can't answer, and it's been multiple, multiple times you've been asked that question, then maybe you should get on that uh, from a skills perspective. You can read people's faces and that's one skill that people need to generate or create or get better at is reading people as much as possible if you're boring them i mean i'm not saying like know what they're thinking i'm not advocating that anyone pays money to become a mind reader although if you do become one that's cool it's just you can tell from people's behaviors if you're answering their questions or not you can tell if they're bored or not so be aware of your surroundings be self-aware so you can get better and if you're looking for any like skills training soft skills training or coaching we the sales engineers is there for you check it out connect with me let me know what you need and i'm happy to help that's it for me with that i'm signing off